We're setting off on an adventure, just the two of us, initially, to understand the Wild West and its scintillating history, and to see some Trump supporters in their natural habitat. We started the journey in southern New Mexico, in a small town called Hachita, intersecting the Continental Divide Trail. Gas was cheaper here, in the middle of godforsaken nowhere, than in the whole of California. We took it for a good sign. Mexico, stolen from the Mexicans originally, and from which Mexico was later named, sort of the opposite of New England. Americans took the land, but Mexico got the name. Not sure who the real winner is there. I wonder what the Mayans think of all this. Perhaps what's mine is yours. You can see the wall that Trump built to keep the Mexicans safe from coronavirus. We rode alongside a highway before camping in a random spot beyond a roadhouse, surrounded by glorious views of cows and their dung, and falling asleep to the sweet lullaby of a million mosquitoes. The New Mexico sunsets are unique and surreal. Spiky cactuses silhouetting against the pastel darkening sky. The next day, after Brent has suggested we get up at 3 a.m. and depart by 3.12, I had a bit of a mutiny and pulled it back to a reasonable 7 a.m. departure. We rode up a big gravel road by an old homestead before hitting Silvertown. This town, as name implied, was primarily focused on mining, mostly copper actually. taste of alpine weather, a rainstorm that mostly helped keep the dust down and cleaned our bikes for free as we rode through Gila National Forest. Wildflowers abounded by the roadside and we camped on another BLM land uh, area once the rain stopped. This town was my main reason for wanting to ride the Divide. There were only two pie shops there, one of which had just recently permanently closed, so calling it Pie Town was a bit of a stretch. And the blueberry pie we had for breakfast did not disappoint. We continued up through forest land and climbed over 9,000 feet, winding up switchbacks occasionally losing our GPS signal. Things got interesting near Ignacio Chavez Wilderness Area, our first section designated difficult on the map, a red section. It was deceivingly easy but very rocky and long. On a steep section I dropped my bike in a rut trying to uh, get a little fancy. We took a break eating jerky and tuna, talking about recovery from setbacks and depression.
the rest of the intermediate track was brutal. An old river bed with sandy ruts between rocky terraces. Brent bombed down in his 500 EXC without a second thought. Me not so much, I was a little bit terrified. that a guy on a heavily loaded KLR had broken his leg in this section. We rode through some aspens to an old cattle yard, including a log cabin that had a bunch of 12 penny nails, a, pe a measure of how much they used to cost for a hundred. Brent used the antique shitter and we salvaged some water from a spring nearby. We made camp that night in a grove of pine and aspen trees, almost on the Colorado borders. We made mushroom tacos and then things got a little interesting. Oh shit, where are the tea bags anyway, you miserable prick? <laughs> <laughs> I think they're right there. Yeah. Well, fucking get them, I'm with you, lazy, <laughs> lazy bastard. Anyway, well, I'm too busy still sitting the, here doing nothing. Still in the trash bag. <laughs> Bastard. Yeah. Oh, shit. Oh, that's... <laughs> Jesus Christ. Fucking went straight in the horse shit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no fucking wonder. You're We're right. drinking the... Oh, it's a delightful <laughs> earthy flavour. <laughs> drinking the, the water out of the fucking cow's piss. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and was sprinkled with horse shit. <laughs> Oh, finest organic. We'll fucking shit be, in the land, though. We'll be fucking dead by daybreak. Yeah. <laughs> we'll probably fucking come back with a cure for corona. <laughs> Just fucking lick three horse turds and then. Uh, <laughs> these, nothing kills these cunts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all you gotta do is drink a fucking <laughs> cow piss and horse turds. <laughs> yeah, then you won't die of a cold. Yeah, that's bit. right. You say, Jesus. fuck it, I'd rather die with a fucking COVID. <laughs> Oh. You get fucked. Jesus Christ. Here. <laughs> you gotta get it. some get some of this. I thought you were gonna fucking throw it at me. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Did I ever tell you about when oh. Candy and I went to the fucking big pineapple? <laughs> went to it. Yeah. No. You know what it is, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like the big mango and all that. Oh yeah, yeah. It was super fucking, ball, super fucking, bullshit. It's a fucking big deal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a big pineapple. What is it? There's a big fucking... We're just up, fucking fresh off the boat a few days, so to yeah. speak. And we're over in Noosa, and I said, I said to her, um, mm -hmm. it's kind of a bit of a rainy day, and I said, look, let's go over to this, this fucking tourist trap, the big pineapple. This giant pineapple. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, she's a fucking city girl, been dancing in all these fucking world capitals and stuff, and... Yeah. So, um, we... <laughs> Where are you there? Are you oh, fixing yeah, your bike? So <laughs> fucking know it's your girl a good time. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a fucking petting zoo. A couple of petting, uh, There's a petting, petting zoo in the pineapple. <laughs> petting, petting zoo. Jesus. And they have little fucking goats and sheep and whatever other little fuckers. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ! Inside the pineapple. <laughs> No, <laughs> I think they're hillbillies. <laughs> no, they have a little. They have all these outbuildings and farms oh. and shit, you know. And uh, you go in there and you fucking. So you buy these peanuts and you fucking feed them <laughs> fucking animals. You pay for peanuts. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't get paid.
quaking aspens littered the hillsides and broke up piney climbs. We hit Colorado, long sweeping road sections, a little bit of rain, and then we had lunch. We ran into the three folks riding alongside us at a hot spring. Mike, the twin pony towed electrician on a DR650, Julio on another KTM 690 who works in industrial machinery, and Tasha, Mike's wife, who works in uh, dog behavior, I think riding a DRZ400. Breckenridge itself was full of traffic and a bit of a pain. Go 42 mile single track section. The only evidence of another track, a tiny hiking track that had a no quad bike sign on it. Self evident. We got on the 42 miles of single track and attempted about 5 miles of it at 3 miles an hour. We got pretty badly beaten, Brent dropped his bright as we tried to turn around. The bikes were more than capable, but this was no time for attempting the run maniacs in the middle of nowhere on a single track with bikes full of luggage a few days into a 3 week journey. We backed down and rode back along the intermediate route with a view of jagged rocky mountains. Here we are up a fucking hard single track like idiots. A misadventure followed.
on some ramps. We dropped the bikes a few times and we moved about two miles in about two hours. The other three guys that had been running alongside us decided to turn back and went another way. Smart. surfing in the river there. We had another milkshake because Brent's obsessed with them. Despite scorning me for drinking Powerade containing dyes and sugar and all that shit. passed over plenty of cattle guards. They were clearly failing as we saw plenty of cattle roaming around. When I rode over them, I always hit the gas to leap the front tire up. We later found out from one of our California riders that Matt had gotten a pinch flat with his tire hitting the edge of the concrete, causing it to rupture. Rawlins, Wyoming was the first stop. It was a pretty nothing town that had seen better days. Frustratingly, we'd been on highways for 80 miles or so out of Colorado. Nice views, but we didn't come this far to sit on the tarmac. Hard to believe there wasn't a nice back road to travel on. We had a great Thai lunch at a place that was self-proclaimed the best Thai in Wyoming. Probably the only Thai. Filled up with gas and I picked up a small bottle of Crown Royale, in plastic of course. I got excited leaving the service station and did a one foot wheelie. Brent later told me that opposite the service station was the police station. I expected the so called badlands of Wyoming to be desolate, boring and endless. But once we got off the highway and through a small oil and gas town, we hit the real open road. Hundreds of gravel miles, big, sweeping, flowing corners, and gentle hills flowed like chocolate sauce. We got right into the zone. There were pump jacks on the horizon, more wildflowers everywhere. And then magically, in the setting sun on the horizon, dozens of wild mustangs. We rode another hairpin turn, antelope ran across the road and then circled back right in front of us like kamikaze bambies. That night we camped in a river bank. It was probably the best side of the trip so far after all that high desert and empty gold mines. I'd ridden past a hiker while filming, hiking the Continental Divide. He'd done 27 miles that day, painstakingly, slowly, 
it was pretty impressive. At 9.30, it was completely still that night, the air thick. Suddenly at 9.31, it was 40 knot winds and a lightning storm. They'd been so peaceful and quiet all day, we'd not even staked our tents down. Very nearly cooked them on the now raging fire, breathed into life from the blustery gale. We battened down the hatches and went to bed. The next day we rode into Pinedale, another little red section that was difficult. After we pulled over, my bike had burnt a lot of oil. It started to get a little concerning. We did a full oil change at the next service station and we drove up towards Union Pass. My buddy Ricky from Utah was to join us the next day after the Tetons. We passed through the historic South Pass of Wyoming, home to gold miners, and an important passage on the Oregon Trail. Some of America's first gold diggers, I suppose, before Melania Trump. We walked around a couple of gold mines, the incredible old buildings still standing and the old crushing equipment still intact. We ignored the signs saying we will shoot trespassers on site and were probably not exaggerations. The South Pass was a big reprieve for early fur trappers. It was one of the only passages through the Rocky Mountains in this part of the world. It felt good to do it on cutting-edge motorcycles, just like the Wagners of old did, except for half our village didn't die along the way. It was home to the first cross-continent telegraph, far before Instagram and even MySpace came along. Probably how the old people sent cat videos to each other, and also allowed the Latter-day Saints passage to Utah. We rode through Wyoming by the smoky Teton Mountains. The smoke reminded me of California burning in Colorado too. It's one of my favorite places. We could barely even make the Teton Mountains out through all the smoke, but we did see a bear and four cubs cross the road. We never found out why. We camped by a big lake that night, waiting for Ricky on his DR650. He taught me to ride off-road back in 2014 on my KLR650, and now we're full circle. We split from Ricky for a minute, approaching another difficult section. We thought it was easy at first, and then we found that there was no bridge to cross the small river. We had to make some fast 12-inch deep sandy sections later as well as pass by from bovine spectators. We passed through Targi National Forest, named after the sheep by the same name. Targi literally translates from Native American into high mountainous place for riding on side-by-sides and sliding down hills in elongated shoes for winter. We split off from Ricky, heading north, and we broke off the trail to meet up with our third companion, Jamie, at his family's ranch in Belgrade, just outside Bozeman, Montana. The country is beautiful, and the small towns we've seen thus far are so signs of aging. Bozma was the biggest metropolis we'd seen in a few weeks. It felt kind of weird, but nice to have some creature comforts. stayed for a couple of days at Jamie and Kenya's family ranch in Belgrade, overlooked by the Sacagawea and Ross Peaks, startling mountain crags that towered over the rural valley. Brett had explained that Sacagawea was an explorer, mediator, and amber alert enthusiast. 
Incredible story, really, and a fitting tribute to the one dollar coin that almost no one uses. We left the ranch blissful after a couple of days of bourbon, great food, laughs, and friends, thanks to Kenya, and headed southwest to intercept the track near the Idaho border, flush with fields. Riding through a skiing resort alongside Lewis and Clark Caverns, I did some reading and the caverns actually have nothing to do with either Lewis or Clark. From what I understand, Lewis and Clark were probably America's first celebrity gay couple. Two men who went on a boat trip, one called Merriweather, they weren't up to anything. Really? They had lunch in a tiny little place. After lunch and a short trip north, we hit an impossible looking climb called Fleecer Hill. We started up, Brent and Jamie first, and they took off. I followed third, much to my chagrin, and what was later determined to be an oil ring failure. My engine was stalling at low rev, so I had to gas it up. I got about a third of the way up, did a big wheelie, and dropped the bike. Definitely not my skill level, clearly an engine problem. I then gave Jamie a demonstration of an Australian tradition after Brent, and he came back after about 10 minutes. I screamed obscenities and bloody murder at Brent, leaving me on the hill without any help. Little did I know that they'd crashed too further up. I thought they were having a snack bar. The steep half mile hill was shaly and washed out. We had a really hard time restarting. And in the end, I had to traverse up my own made switchbacks through the heather. It was a hell of an adventure, but was that the end? Not quite. I was pushing Brent up around the corner with his own switchbacks, and I heard a small cry for help. I thought it was probably Jamie playing funny buggers, but I thought I'd better check. I walked down the hill, and it was a fella called Barry laying there. He was riding down the hill on a heavy motor busy 850, with probably way too much luggy weighing about 120 pounds. He got deer in the headlights coming over the hill, panicked and bombed past Jamie at an estimated 40 miles an hour, at which point he veered off the road, luckily, and was clotheslined by a pine tree, and the motor busy rode over about four times. We found him on the ground, made sure he was okay, and then with three, the three of us with Brent riding, we got his bike down the hill. We later found out he'd ridden a mile, crashed again, and called the sheriff three broken vertebra. I was amazed it wasn't worse. It was a good lesson and reminder though. We hit Butte, Montana next known for the largest, most useless water feature of any city anywhere. Huge and desolate, they realized a little too late that a toxic mine site in the center of town may not bring in big investment tourist dollars. While sheltering that morning from the heavy rain, we judged the teeth of the guys we saw in the coffee shop. It appeared they may be using lake water in their morning routines. On through another difficult red section, but it was nothing compared to the intermediate, apparently, Fleecer Hill. We had our first flat outside Helena. It was on my bike. Of course, in Bozeman, I'd upgraded the most heavy duty steel radial tire to save $10, and the tire was like putting a steel shoe horse on a bison. Jamie helped out with a few small sticks to act as rim jams while Brent muscled the tire off. 
I had the chore of filling the tube. I checked it and patched it three times and we put it on after about 45 minutes, the Boston thing. We rode on, only to find out about an hour later, just outside the Montana capital, Helena, it was flat again. I cursed my shoddy tube seals. Incredibly, the side wall was so thick and strong on this tire that I rode on a complete flat to the nearest KTM dealership in Helena. We dropped the bike off and talked to the salespeople. They told us how they couldn't get enough motorcycles to sell in 2020. Everyone's buying KTMs now because of COVID. When the tire technician finally came out, he came with a small piece of wood. I immediately recognized it as Jamie's tire holder. The bastard had dropped it into the rim. Miraculously, I'd ridden 50 miles with a 12 inch stick in my tube and it had been ruptured the whole way. Towards Sealy Lake, we stopped in the morning in a sea of Trump Pence 2020 flags to a lovely small town of Lincoln, Montana. The breakfast I had was for a king, biscuits, gravy, pancakes, everything. It was my birthday that day and was about $8. Not a $17 avocado toast to be seen. We pushed on past some not lovely wildflowers and some more old mining sites. This one had burnt down, but looked like a beauty based on the stonework remaining. Outside the small motel, Jamie started talking to a guy who was riding a sublime Honda Goldwing that he'd set up as an enduro. It was Mike who runs Taco Moto, who'd actually fitted out Jamie's KTM with all its enduro gear. I was on the phone to my wife Fern that night, walking around the car park, and a giant elk came within three feet. Montana never fails to impress. We had a few bourbons, care of the boys, a slice of cheesecake and a few laughs, and we headed back to the hotel. We kept riding north, a little cleaner this time, climbed up another mountain range. We had a crack in a little red difficult section, but it was pretty much impossible, even more log strewn than the disastrous Colorado section that had taken us two hours to go nowhere. We skipped it probably wisely and rode along with the grace of Montana's mountains surrounding us. Who's the uh, only Aussie to win the tour? In the afternoon, we hit Columbia Falls after skirting alongside Flathead Lake and met up with Brent's friend Tootie at Whitefish. Tootie and his wife were absolute crackers. Tootie was from his hometown of Queensland and almost as inbred as Brent. Yeah, me too. Coming out of Bozeman. Tootie and his wife drove us around town for a day and we had dinner. They were gracious hosts. We spent the last day driving up to Glacier on the bikes. It felt almost tame with people after we'd been so remote just days before. It was spectacular though. The lakes with their clear water, craggy domineering peaks, windswept plains and big winding roads. The journey ends with a scene that punctuated the whole rurality of the trip, the passing over of cattle guards. We must have ridden over hundreds of these over the three weeks, some while slightly in the air, some sitting in the saddle tired, and some glad to be finally hitting the bitumen after a long day. A constant companion like Brent these trips, between making progress and worrying you'd hit it and blow up. Good to have a mate like Brent and Jamie too.